So, I noticed we got a new version of Windows uh, installed on our system, and that start menu being white is a, is a dead giveaway that you now have the May 2020 update for Windows 10. One um, or two rather big issues with the Windows 10 update is, number one, we have a system-wide dark mode, woohoo! And number two is that Windows Services for Linux 2 ha is now um, installed by uh, default. So now we, we get the ability to run a native Docker using Windows Home or using Windows Education. So we, we don't actually have to have a pro or a enterprise version of Windows to run Docker, Docker anymore. Um, some uh, enterprising minds have run uh, Windows services for Linux, uh, but uh, that's in, in some uh, test mode or some preview mode. So now the rest of us have uh, Windows services for Linux, and this is a clean install of Windows 10. Um, so I've gone through the installation process. I downloaded the did the ISO from uh, Windows. I've got my 14-day uh, trial period. And I'm doing the kinds of things that a developer would do uh, at the first day, and that is to install some of the utilities that a developer would need to achieve an outcome. Now, Docker seems to be a part of many people's workflow, and uh, for good reason. Um, we can start developing in environments which are very close to our production environment. So what I'm doing in this uh, beginning stage is I've downloaded Chrome, uh, Git, uh, the command line utility, uh, Visual Studio Code, and Docker Desktop. So this, this, uh, this particular process is going to take a little bit of time to, to work through. Um, as each one of those pieces of software is coming down. I'm going to use all of them uh, in consort with each other, and I'll need to use the Windows command line interface. Now, uh, if you sign up with the Windows Store, you should be able to get the new terminal, um, and uh, we're still waiting for uh, the new Windows terminal, so while we wait for that, we're going to uh, use uh, PowerShell. And PowerShell is a, um, a distant uh, second-rate uh, citizen compared to the, uh, the Windows terminal. So again, we, we wait for the next major update before we get that one uh, in our environment. So what I'm doing here is uh, I'm working through all of those pieces of software, Docker, Git, and Visual Studio Code. Um, why would we want to use these uh, these utilities? Well, um, a lot of our hosting environments are, are Linux informed, but our development environments tend to be a bit more GUI friendly. Uh, so Mac seems to uh, be a, uh, a, a a wise choice for many web developers, but I think Windows is become um, more reasonable in terms of its ability to emulate what uh, kinds of development environments uh, exist uh, both in the cloud and um, uh, many data centers that, uh, that we work in. So uh, in order to, to get our pipeline to work, the first thing that we, we ultimately need is, is the, uh, the Git um, protocol and the Git command line utility is a perfect utility for this. Note also that when you do install Git, you can get a version of Git Bash. Uh, it's a cut down version of the uh, born again shell that comes with many Linux distributions. So instead of using PowerShell, you're welcome to d jump into the Git Bash environment and it will give you uh, command line utilities that are very similar to, the, again, those hosting environments that we're used to uh, placing our code into. So as a Windows user in this particular instance, um, we have all of the um, abilities to, to use a graphical interface uh, with the added benefit of actually running native um, services like uh, um, Node, um, PHP, um, uh, MySQL, um, CouchDB or MongoDB, and, and those are the sorts of things that we, we would like executing um, in exactly the same way that they would run in cloud or hosting environments. So a Docker becomes our gateway, and, and as a developer, you probably want to run Docker on your development environment so that you can be assured that in production, uh, your code is going to execute, execute flawlessly. 
So what I'm doing here is I'm confirming that some of this software is installed. So I'm just confirming that Git uh, now executes in um, PowerShell and in the uh, the Git um, Bash shell. Um, and with Visual Studio Code installed, what we can also do is we can grab ourselves a bunch of plugins that make interacting with Docker or interacting with Git a, a far less painful process. So we can uh, introspect uh, the Windows services for Linux uh, containers that are executing uh, directly inside uh, Visual Studio Code, which gives us uh, an ability to stay in flow. We don't have to chop and change all the time to, to work out um, what's going on. We can just stay directly inside our Visual Studio Code without, without any interruption. So uh, one thing that you'll notice when you've installed the uh, the May edition of uh, Windows 10 is that the start menu has gone white. Um, that is your indication that you are in um, a, a, a coloration or light mode uh, and you can uh, jump into desktop settings and switch to dark mode. And, and what will happen is uh, Windows Explorer, uh, the, uh, the browser, um, and most of your utilities will um, understand that uh, system-wide dark mode and, and generate a theme that, that is consistent with, a, with a, a dark environment. So I'm confirming that I have installed virtualization uh, inside Windows because we can't run Docker unless we have a virtualization running. So uh, what Docker wants to do is, is to install Windows components or, or Windows uh, pieces. Then that's not uh, software. That's not um, the, the normal software like Word or Excel. Uh, it's, it's more system software. So we can install servers and we can install um, utilities that make our development process a little bit better. Um, but I think our work practice should be sort of focused towards Docker, should be focused towards using Docker containers, irrespective of the development environments that we choose to work in. So we may use Windows, we may, may use Mac, we also might use Linux as our a development environment, but it doesn't matter uh, which, which development environment we use because we know that our endpoints will be um, some containerized environment. So what I'm doing here is I'm authorizing my uh, Visual Studio code to access the GitHub account that I have so I can seamlessly push and pull inside Visual Studio code. So again, instead of having to know the command line, instead of having to you know practice um, the process of, of uh, git clone, git pull, git push, git um, commit. Um, that can all be done um, directly inside Visual Studio Code. I do have the uh, restart um, uh, problem, uh, which seems to sort of um, infest Windows generally, is, is that uh, because we've installed virtualization, we have to reboot. Because we've installed the Docker desktop, we have to reboot. Um, and hopefully that will be the last time. So what I'm doing is is attempting to start our Docker server um, and um, looking for it in the start menu and uh, giving it a go. It, wh what it'll do is it'll um, create an icon in the system tray uh, and we have to explicitly open up the, um, the Docker desktop. What you'll notice here is that Docker will fail unless it has WSL2 um, updated. And I think this is more related to systems that may have had WSL1 pre-installed. So if you're one of those people that have tried the Windows services for Linux, you've upgraded to um, the May update, you'll need to follow this particular process of actually physically updating your Windows services for Linux from version 1 to version 2. Um, so uh, I found the page. Uh, it's mentioned that directly inside the um, PowerShell. So PowerShell's directed me to this page. It's a Microsoft page, and it's uh, telling me that I need to download and install um, that extra piece of software. Now, if you install Windows from scratch um, using the 2004 uh, Windows update, May or, or newer, um, this step shouldn't be necessary. Um, that is, Windows services for Linux 2 should be the thing that was installed from uh, the first moment of, of execution of your operating system. Um, 
what we're also looking for is the uh, the necessary settings in BIOS. And you'll see in this particular video, I get to a point where I realize that the actual operating system that this environment is running under, the um, VMware, um, doesn't actually have the right um, settings. So I'm, I'm going in and I'm recognizing if you look at the top of the error uh, up here, it says something like virtualization, uh, check that virtualization is enabled. Um, what we need to do is we need to reboot our systems to support that virtualization. Um, and in VMware, there is a, a, a little checkbox that we can, we can check. Um, you, if you're running this off your laptop or your desktop, you'll need to do exactly the same. You'll need to go into BIOS and you'll need to tell that BIOS that you want virtualization. It will not execute otherwise. And that's if you're using VirtualBox or VMware or any kind of virtualization technology. Um, it just uh, The operating system needs to be able to access virtualization features in the, um, in the, in the BIOS, in, in the physical equipment that uh, the computer provides you. So what I'm doing here in VMware in my parent OS is I'm just opening up the, uh, the settings panel, um, pushing up the memory, I think, um, but also uh, turning on virtualization. And you can see there's a, a number of options in VMware Player. Um, that we can use and you can work through each one individually to confirm that things are okay but um, if you're using this uh, with physical hardware or you're using it in a virtualized environment make sure your uh, virtualization has that um, <laughs> virtualization open so the virtual server has an ability to run a virtual server painful irony there so what I'm doing is I'm running Linux um, VMware to run Windows and then I'm using Windows services for Linux to run Linux inside my Windows inside my Linux so uh, irony there um, so I'm going to start up uh, Docker again and hopefully instead of uh, getting a red um, icon that represents my Docker did not start hopefully I'm going to get a Docker did start um, what I'll see is two containers. So I, I think what Docker Desktop will do, uh, you can see in the bottom left, I've got um, a orange um, Docker is loading statement, and I should see a green Docker is running once once all of the um, the first boot uh, processes are finished. And I can do a WSL minus L to list all of the um, all of the containers that are running. And there are two containers that are running Docker so that you can run containers in Docker. So ironically, <laughs> I'm running a, Win a Linux desktop uh, running in VMware Windows, which in itself is running Windows services for Linux that's running Docker so that I can run containers inside Docker. So it'll be a VM inside a VM inside a VM. So I'm going through the uh, Hello World um, uh, wizard that um, the first run of Docker Desktop gives us, and it shows us the process. And we have uh, the first process, and that is to pull from a repository, which is on GitHub, a public repository. The second step is to now uh, CD into that directory and then do a build process. So we we need to pull down the Docker images for this Hello World example. Um, and and run them. And it does take a little bit of time to run, so I'm having a little bit of a play with Docker in other consoles as the build process goes. So you can see that you, you do Docker PS or Docker processes, and you'll see all of the running Docker processes. Um, so you can do that in PowerShell, you can do that inside the Docker desktop itself, or in this particular instance, I'm going to install the Docker plugin, which gives us the um, ability to view running instances of Docker inside uh, Visual Studio Code, which is, is very handy. Again, keeps you in flow, keeps you in process, and saves you from having to, um, to leave your editor for any reason. The firewall's kicking up. It's saying, hey, you, you've now said start Docker or start the, um, the Docker containers. And in there, I need port 80 opened. So your firewall is going to have a little bit of a whinge and say, hey, this application wants to expose port 80 on this secure environment. Do you want to do that? And do you want to do that from now on? So you might actually tell um, your Windows firewall to go away. You trust everything that Docker is doing. 
So you can see here what I'm doing is I'm saying 127.0.01, which is this computer, um, port 80, which is the Docker container. So inside the Docker container, we have something running, um, and it's called the Docker 101 tutorial. So we're executing a container, and we can SSH or more 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 specifically shell into that running container and we can see processes from inside the container what's even nicer is we should be able to edit and push and pull repositories from in those containers as well um copy files in copy files out and and generally do the dev as if uh, we were in production so if we can keep our production instances of docker the same as our development instances of docker we won't have that classic uh, situation where it ran in dev and I don't care about the production problems because everything worked all right for me if dev is production and production is dev using docker then there is no excuse for either the dev team or the production team to to uh, you know point at each other so Docker Desktop itself will show you running Docker instances. So you can see that Docker tutorial is executing and we can do the same things that we did in Visual Studio Code. We can shell into the environment. We can start and stop containers. What I'm going to do here um, is I'm going to pull a repository down and I've, a repository that I've made, which is called the SQL class. And I, I'm doing exactly what I did in Docker Desktop, but instead I'm doing it inside Visual Studio Code. So I'm saying docker compose up, which is a command to just say take all of my containers and bring them up. Um, not throw them up, but bring them up, bring them up into running state. And this uh, SQL class has two containers. It's got one container for a PHP MyAdmin front end, and it's got another container for uh, a MariaDB instance that's running a specific database that we use in our classes. So um, because this is a brand new computer, we haven't downloaded those two containers, MariaDB nor um, uh, uh, PHP MyAdmin, uh, we're going to, to download them and then we're going to bring them up or we're going to execute them. And this um, console information is the console that uh, a computer would give you when it boots up. So we're getting the kinds of things that a computer would do in, virtualized, in a virtualized environment. So now you can see under Docker Desktop here, there is my SQL class and two containers that are running in consort with each other. That is two containers that know each other exist in a virtual network. And those two containers, uh, one has exposure to the outside world via port 8080 and another that doesn't. So MySQL, or sorry, MariaDB, does not have any exposure to the open internet. PHP MyAdmin is the um, is the gateway into manipulating. Um, and you can see the, the spew coming off the server there will show uh, log files or show um, access log files. Now, I, as soon as I control C or, or stop those containers from the console, you can see um, the uh, Docker desktop also um, uh, grays out that um, uh, that uh, those containers to show that they're stopped. So this ends the quick introduction to Docker. Uh, I hope you found it useful and we hope to be useful with it in the coming weeks and months. Thank you for your time.